I will say I learned my uh, diplomatic skills in um, Alabama, because going, uh, I actually worked at the University of Alabama after being an Auburn graduate. And I, I used to tell my friends uh, that uh, Auburn was in my heart as a young child. It was something that I loved. Um, and I tell my Alabama friends that that was a childhood indiscretion, and please forgive me for that. <laughs> uh, we've got a, a lot of conversation today to talk about things, and one of them is really about uh, how we connect uh, the workforce uh, to education and the economy. And I sort of want to give you a three-year swath of uh, Americana. Uh, blue is uh, jobs gained in particular uh, parishes and counties in this country, and red is jobs lost. And you can talk about how different the world is in, in, in our modern economy and how we can connect uh, all the pieces to make sure that we participate in a very positive way here into the future. So here's uh, uh, job gains and losses over a three-year period in America. Uh, that was the uh, end of uh, October 2009. I, um, I had to let the guy go that was doing these charts for me at that time. So. Um, I think the big thing is that we have to keep in mind is the world did change. How we respond in the world and how we respond in business. This actually came from Slate.com. We just made it uh, graphically different. The other thing that comes, and I'm one of those government people that doesn't believe in government, right? So I get a lot of my data from the Shadow Government Statistics Newsletter, which is sort of the guys that try to make sure the truth is the truth. And the key is to keep in mind that our um, unemployment rate at its peak was like about 9.7 percent. But if you count all the people that gave up, it's 22 percent. Now, if you remember when we were talking about countries that were in big problems all over the world that we would come in and save, they would say things like one in five people are on the streets and unemployed in those countries. Well, that's us today. And what do we do to make sure that our American dream, the world that, that we've all believed in, is going to maintain and be forward? Now, this has happened many times in history. And uh, a good example is when um, uh, artisans used to make all the clothes were replaced by um, a piece of machinery, the mechanical loom. And when that me mechanical loom came into a community, uh, four people and one loom would replace 100 workers instantly overnight. And so their whole economy, everything that they had done, everything that they had learned had changed. And what ended up, you had compression of wages. You'll see that in our current economy. Restructuring of the economy, which is good. There are opportunities for us as uh, business people and people in higher ed to, to try to adapt and make sure that we're going to be successful. And then it does question, um, is that idea that the American dream is possible? Um, you know, when I was a kid, I was talked to my dad. Uh, we lived in uh, two trailers with a dog trot in between in Alabama. In Alabama, we live in trailers. Um, um, but uh, my dad was disabled in World War II, enough so that all of us got to go to college for free. So of the six kids living in that environment, um, three have doctorates, two have a master's, and one has a bachelor's degree. And that's the importance of education in allowing people to have access to the American dream. Um, but the question is, are we in that place anymore. Here we are at the bottom in the red. It talks about that we were once tops in education, and now we're ranked fairly much, uh, fairly far behind in some of the things that are important when you're trying to do chemistry or um, physics or anything that's uh, you know, advanced technology type things. And our great uh, resource shortage is going to be U.S. scientists as one part of it. And the other is just people that uh, know how to actually uh, operate a, a fancy machine and understand the, the nature of those kind of things. And the world has changed. The, the idea of what the American dream is about, uh, those of you that uh, are my age in the 70s, 74% uh, of the middle class had a high school diploma or less. The American dream could occur by a lot of hard work, a good work ethic, and, um, and moving forward. But in 2007, only 39% uh, of the middle class had a high school diploma or less. So the world has changed. And we have to think about how do we give people that opportunity to have access to that American dream that makes uh, it all important. And in this document, it talks about projections for the future, and even uh, the short future. 2018 is not that far from here. But it says that uh, the higher ed's become the gatekeeper. But it also said that 60% uh, of all the jobs will require some post-secondary credential, associate, certificate, bachelor's, or even beyond uh, in this. And in this country, 60%. For Louisiana, a little bit less. 
About 50 percent of our jobs will require that some post-secondary credential. And then we have less than half of what will be needed. And this is what they've said in this document about Louisiana specifically, and that's why it's important for all of us to be engaged in higher education. Unless there are systemic changes in 2018, Louisiana will rank sixth in the nation for uh, high school jobs for high school dropouts, fifth for high school graduates, 50th for those with an associate's degree, 45th for those with a college degree, and 47th with those uh, with graduate degrees, and rank next to last in all jobs for those with post-secondary degree. Now, is that where we want to be? No. No is the right answer, yes. Um, and I do believe we are at a turning point, and Louisiana has to decide to be a source for cheap labor or to reinvest in their workforce, and we'll talk about that in a minute. So what is our collective vision of Louisiana, what it'll look like? And here's Louisiana, if you look at the relationship between per capita income, um, uh, here's per capita income, and here's the adult population with a bachelor's degree or higher. You can sort of see it moves along, and then you get to D.C. where we send all our, our bright people to become lobbyists and lawyers. Um, but anyway, this is the correlation here. The key is that you can actually change the numbers. Uh, I worked in Oklahoma. Of course, they're a good uh, petroleum state. Uh, they had a goal to increase their numbers, and they went from uh, 46 to 42nd in about eight years in this ranking. And that's because they had an initiative called Brain Game that said, we want to change the dynamics. And there's another state on this map, so, uh, North Dakota. Um, they you know, have a good shale play. And what they've done is they've decided to use any of the uh, tax revenues that are getting from that and invest it in higher education because they know they have about one generation, maybe two, and that, that uh, play will run out. And they're going to have to have a workforce for that economy that everybody will want to come to North Dakota for. And they believe it's going to need to be in educated workers. So those are some things that can happen if you do uh, keep your eye on the prize and move things forward. Here we are with young adults with uh, any, any credential, associate degree or higher. Uh, we're next to last to Arkansas where I worked as commissioner of higher ed. I was, it's not all my fault. So, um, but you think about where we want to be and um, how we make that work. Um, and there's a lot of reports out there that if there's a manufacturing, we get an F for human capital. Um, and then I want to mention this, and this is sort of the only uh, something I'm going to say about oil that isn't great. Um, Pass the books, hold the oil was a, a Thomas Friedman editorial about three weeks ago. And it really talks about the relationship that, uh, that countries that have lots of uh, natural resources don't invest in their people. And he said that uh, one of the things we should think about is we could think about uh, Taiwan, which you know is this um, island off of uh, big China. And he says that the only thing that they have to export is their human capital. And because of that, they heavily invest in that. He says their natural resources are so low that they have to uh, import sand to make concrete. So um, the key here is, and then the line at the bottom is that uh, the foreign countries with the most NASDAQ uh, listed folks are in places that don't have many natural resources. So now we have an opportunity in this state. We've got good natural resources. We've got all these things going. But if we invest in our people, we'll make sure that they have the skills that we need to move forward. Because as you know, even in the chemical industry, you know, at one point, brawn was what it was all about. Uh, I'm from Alabama. We built steel mills. We had all those things. But the technology changed, and we needed skilled workers for uh, uh, all our uh, factory work and uh, to help us create new products. The whole thing is about um, building communities that have a good balance. Building the new communities, a new economy will have to have places that have good college and access to good health care. Um, and I sort of envision it as, uh, from the Wizard of Oz, that place that you see, that emerald city, which everybody can see those great opportunities. And because we have a lot of things playing here in Louisiana together, I believe we have that opportunity in the near future to be that emerald city for lots of places. The book actually mentions Baton Rouge, uh, which is, of course, now the biggest city in the state. Um, and there's some other stuff. The Daily Beast, which is an online a Newsweek publication, ranks three cities in Louisiana. And only Texas had more cities mentioned as uh, places that are on the go. Uh, the other part to keep in mind is where your folks with a bachelor's degree are. The darker colors are with 20% or more, um, which is above the state average. Um, have a bachelor's. Uh, but if you actually take all the people that have a bachelor's or higher, 75% um, of our folks with a bachelor's live in eight parishes. You sort of see where the density, and that's where the growth and the possibilities are going to be. 
is where those educated workers are. And I would think we should think about a vision of how we make work-ready communities by making sure we have that good balance of certificate, associate, and bachelors that make y'all want to expand and um, uh, be successful where you are. We have a, a, a state initiative uh, in our um, uh, master plan, and it's basically to basically, well, near about double the educational attainment of our citizens uh, by 2025 really invest strategically in university research and, and really have our research universities concentrate on the local you know, industrial uh, complex in their area and work very closely with them to support the research that they have there. And then to make sure that we're more efficient and accountable enterprise so that uh, we don't cost an arm and a leg. So let's talk about the education pipeline in Louisiana. And um, this is a national data point, but kids are less likely to graduate than parents. This is a 2008 or 2009, yeah, 2008 quote, but that's from high school in America. So if that's not a wake-up call, then I'll have to try harder for the next wake-up call. But uh, uh, what can we do? Well, here's Louisiana. Of 109th graders, what happens? Uh, we're going to track these guys and before they go into college. 63 of them. Uh, graduate from high school, 36 of those will go directly into college, 31 of those will go full-time, 25 will stay after a year, and six years later, they'll, uh, 12 will have an associate's or a bachelor's. Now, is that a way to build a strong workforce? And that's what we've got to keep in mind, is what we can do to maximize the success of our students. A lot of the K through 12 education reform is based on maximizing our ability to be successful. A lot of our efforts on the higher ed side is designed to do the same thing. Now think about this, 46,000 high school grads, we have to make sure all of those count because we're competing in the economy against other folks. I know there's some folks I just talked to a while ago moving in from Houston. Um, if you think about Dallas, Dallas Metro has 40,000 high school graduates itself. So every kid in this state has to matter and has to um, have the workforce skills to move forward. Most importantly, because Louisianans love Louisiana. 81% of Louisianans are from Louisiana. The nice thing is our workforce is here. If we educate them, they will stay. They're going to stay for their mama, and they're going to stay for the good food, right? <laughs> so that's the key. If we invest in our folks, they're going to be doing well. We have a lot of community colleges and universities throughout the state. These are our economic development regions. The other neat thing is invest locally in your universities if you can, because like in the Region 7, 87% of all the people that go to college go to, call, go to college in that region. So your workforce is going local. And if you want to keep your workforce, invest in your local folks. Certainly, you're going to need to invest in the research uh, institution, uh, LSU, for, and uh, Louisiana Tech, and those kind of things for some of the uh, doctorates and those kind of things. 